Ryan here, and welcome again to the GOG live stream channel on Twitch.tv. Today, I'm going to be talking to Mark Ventrelli, if I didn't completely ruin your name, from Behold Studios about their game Chroma Squad. Hello, Mark. Hello, my name is Not Bruins, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Really happy to be here. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do at Behold Studios? I'm the game designer of Chroma Squad. Uh, I've joined Behold Studios mid-project after like f uh, five months after the Kickstarter. I've been with them for over a year and a half uh, designing this game. So that's pretty much what I do every day, except when I'm doing streamings. That's what I'm doing now. All right, so I'm going to bring the game up here so everybody can see it. What exactly is Chroma Squad? So Chroma Squad is a tactical RPG, right? That's what it says uh, on the logo. But uh, it's basically a game about managing Japanese superheroes like Power Rangers, Change Man, uh, Flash Man, stuff like that. So you guys, you are five guys who are or girls or robots or beavers, it's your choice, uh, who are stuntmen. At, a, at another not so cool hero show, and you decide to open up your own indie studio. So, uh, Chroma Squad is the story of these five stuntmen as they go from indies to riches to other stuff that I won't spoil. It's definitely an interesting game because it's one part management and one part squad based uh, turn based tactics game and another part rpg so it's a lot of different kind of game concepts thrown into one particular title yeah chroma squad is not like a it's not a very run of the mill idea for a game not at all but uh yeah the the management aspects they're very light so i uh, don't go in expecting something like indie dev story or game dev story or tycoon or something like that they're very light uh, the game is mostly a tactical RPG. It's mostly about the, the turn-based battles and outfitting your your party of five, or maybe more, who knows, uh, with the right gear and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, even though it sounds like a lot, it's it's a streamlined game. You you definitely won't be overwhelmed by the amount of thing that go goes in there. Uh, if you don't like management games, you should give Chroma Squad a try because they're light management games. But if you go into the game like uh, expecting a management game, uh, you're going to be disappointed. That's not what the game is about. It's mostly a tactic RPG. So I know that you joined the game about halfway through, but do you know why they decided to be so light on the management side? Considering the whole story of the game that you kind of break off from one company and create your own company, you would think just by that concept it would be more kind of like a tycoon sort of a game instead of as focused on the tactical elements uh actually i was there for that uh when we did the kickstarter uh the original pitch and the original idea in our head was going to be maybe linking more on the management side and less on the rpg uh but you know game development is one of those things where the game also has a voice of its own and uh i think the art of making a good game is like hearing it so uh, as we made Chroma Squad, it became clear that uh, if we were to put a bunch of more complex management mechanics, which the game had at one point, uh, it would just slow the game down and not be as fun and as... The, the main core fun aspects of Chroma Squad, they would not be there if we had not taken that decision. But uh, that, that's also how we developed the game with our Kickstarter backers, right? They have been playing the game with us and sharing their ideas with us all the way through. So uh, we're very confident that we, we made the game better by it because we had the players, the backers giving us feedback and we could actually see what worked and what didn't. I think it was for the benefit of the game in the end. But the fantasy is still there, which is the important part. Like uh, you feel like you're improving your studio, you're buying cameras. I see you bought in your studio right now, like you bought cameras, you bought microphones, or upgrading a studio. You have to take care of marketing. The right. fantasy's there. But uh, it's not, it's very hard for you to like uh, go bankrupt or something like that. It's really hard for you to do that. We kept those things streamlined and simple so we can get the message and the fantasy of the game across. 
Well, that's something that I was kind of wondering about because I've played this game up to season three so far, and I've, I've been enjoying it a lot. Right. And I've gotten, to, I haven't gone bankrupt, but I've basically, after a couple of missions, I'll go to the shop, I'll spend basically all my money, mm -hmm. and then I'll go to the next mission. And I was just wondering if there even was the possibility of going bankrupt in your studio getting shut down. Because in the story, they talk about how they kind of, like, one guy had to sell his car, other people are having, had to cut off their phone, had to cut off the internet because they couldn't afford it because the company's going through some money troubles as they're getting set up. But I wasn't sure if that, is that necessarily reflected off of how much cash you have when you get to those points in the game? Or are those just story elements and you can't really go bankrupt in this game? Uh, you can't really go uh, bankrupt in this game because money, like we don't think money is a problem, right? So uh, the, the main, the important, we're indie devs, like we know that money isn't the most important thing. As long as, as you can survive and you have fans. But uh, in Chroma Squad, you can do, you can have a game over in Chroma Squad, right? Uh, but that's not related to your money, it's related to your fans. So if your fans drop below a certain threshold, which increases as the seasons go on and on, uh, your, your show will shut down. Uh, but if you do manage to put yourself in a situation where you have like negative income, uh, you can get to that. Uh, but you can, you can never lose the game because of that. You just won't have any money, and that would be really bad because you're not, not going to be able to improve your gear, and that would definitely give you a lot of trouble. Uh, but that definitely shouldn't happen on the interesting difficulty unless you're doing something very wrong. So uh, if you just play the game on the challenging difficulty, maybe. But uh, like I said, the game is super streamlined. Uh, we're most we're mostly focused on telling you a great story about the stuntman and having you tell the story with us, uh, with your own decisions and the things and the paths that you take on the story. That was another thing that I was wondering about because early on in the game, one of the first things that happens in it is you break away from a previous studio and then you get an email from the director you used to work for saying that basically kind of like you stole his ideas either uh you'll see you in court or that um you make him your new director or you pay him a chunk of the cash you make from every episode and i i haven't played through all of those different scenarios to mm -hmm. see how they play out but does that mm -hmm. actually factor into some of the things later on yes uh, and what did you choose i chose when... to see him in court so I think mm, I see. somewhere in the last season, I had to fight, do a boss fight with a lawyer. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. So yes, in Chroma Squad, there is a branch of storyline, and you do get to affect the way that the story goes. Uh, and that has enormous repercussions, not only on the way the episodes play out, but also in your team composition, and the way the whole, some whole entire seasons are laid out. And ultimately, in the ending, we have three unique endings in Chroma Squad, plus three secret endings, which nobody found so far. Oh, no one's found them so far. No one's found them so far. Wow, that's... The game has been released yesterday, so here's the I challenge I know, the you, game guys. was only released yesterday, but the internet usually worked pretty quick. Oh, yes. So, yes, they must does. be pretty hidden in there if no one's been able to find them yet. Yeah, I mean, the game, the game is... The game packs a good amount of content. If you play on interesting difficulty, uh, we estimate you're gonna spend over 15 hours of gameplay. So uh, probably the internet haven't had time to beat the game yet. So maybe I've been playing on the medium difficulty, and so far I've been mm -hmm. doing okay. I haven't really had any times where I've really felt like I was necessarily going to lose. Yeah, nice. but I haven't tried on the higher difficulties. Is there any way to change the difficulty after you already started a save file, or yeah, does it not, only not right now. start difficulty? Yeah, not, not right now, but uh, I'm looking at our to-do board on my left here in the studio, and there's a big uh, change difficulty task for us to do, <laughs> so I uh, expect it in a future patch anytime soon. Now, at the moment, I'm actually looking through the equipment for my different characters, and something that I do have to say that I really like about this game, as opposed to some other games, is depending upon what equipment that you have for that character can actually change how they look. There are a lot of games out there where usually the weapon you have equipped might change, but when it comes to clothing, it doesn't necessarily matter. So, I definitely got to appreciate that you guys put the effort into adding a nice detail like that. 
Thank you. Uh, and that's it's super hard to do for 2D games, right? Because our artist for the characters, Hugo, he had to redraw all the animations of all characters every time we added a new suit, right? Mm -hmm. To make it fit. Because in 2D games, Pixar games, it's so hard to do customization. But uh, one of our goals to come with Scott was to have people express themselves, not only with the, with the way they name their squads and their catchphrases and stuff like that, but uh, item progression and selection is like super important for you to just change your helmet and see the helmet change in the character. So yeah, really, I'm really happy that you mentioned that because there was a lot of work. <laughs> Something that I haven't seen yet, but is it actually possible to... I know at the beginning of the game you can pick who you want in your squad if you want guys, if you want girls, if you want a robot and or for some reason a beaver. I'm not sure exactly. why. But you can. Why wouldn't you want a beaver? <laughs> That's a very good I always question. I picked the beaver. That's a very. I almost always pick the beaver too. Mr. But I felt Beaves like picking the uh, picking the robot this time. But is there a way to to kind of get more people or to fire and hire different people, or are the people that you pick at the start of the game the ones you keep for the entire game? Well, I can't spoil how your squad is going to change, uh, but. Mostly this decision is definitive. We even warn you that about that when you finish your selection, that there's no turning back. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely we're definitely excited about doing things for Chroma Squad. For like after you after you finish the game. Right now you don't you don't actually unlock any new actors stuff like that, but that's all the plans. Well right now what you see is what you get. Alright. So I guess it's about time we actually get into a bit of the game game part here. Mm -hmm. Apparently I didn't finish the season finale for season two yet, so we're going to start at the end. And we're going to the be going up against end. some sort of fish lady. which Yes, it's a reverse mermaid. I have to say, I love the design of some <laughs> of the bosses. That's something I wanted to ask you. What was kind of your process when it came fish to made. creating the bosses because the game's kind of got this monster of the week theme when it comes to the bosses uh -huh. and some of them are kind of <laughs> well they're they're definitely different i can say that there, there was a point where <laughs> I, I fought a box with boxing gloves and then yes, i fought the a barrel box. So, <laughs> well what's your process when it comes to creating uh, so many different and varied bosses <laughs> Well, it was two things that inspired us. Like first, first we were making an, a story about an indie recording studio, right? So for the first seasons, you're very indie, you're super poor. So uh, the boxing box was the kind of thing that you can actually afford to do, right? Uh, but the other influence for that was actual Sentai shows, Tokusatsu's, because uh, these shows have all the craziest monsters. Like you have no idea. Like we we thought we knew about some crazy ones. From the, from the shows that we used to watch as kids and stuff like that. But when we started to dig in and really get monster references from these things, oh my god, there's so many crazy monsters. Like uh, the, the, the reverse mermaid isn't even in the top 25. I'm, I'm a little bit scared by that. <laughs> <laughs> there are some really crazy monsters, both in our game and in tokusatsu culture. I guess really that kind of makes game. sense because when it comes to stuff like that, they had to make a lot of characters you'd probably only see maybe once or twice. So they basically had to go with every idea they po they came up with. <laughs> probably. Uh, I really don't know what was going on with those guys, but they were super creative and we loved them. Like I wanted to, Every time someone tried to like censor a monster idea for being like too crazy here, behold... We always like remember examples from Sentai. Like for instance, we always remember a monster called Vega, which uh, his special ability was to make one of the uh, rangers pregnant, like a male ranger. He got a male ranger pregnant. That's the monster ability. He created the Vega baby. Okay, that is not at <laughs> all what I expected to hear. That is yes, definitely and... strange. And that's a show that was recorded and watched by kids all over the world. A uh, uh, monster that his special ability was to make a male ranger pregnant. All right, that's definitely strange. <laughs>
But we talked about a little bit of the influences, shows like Power Rangers and stuff that influenced a lot of the theming when it came to Chroma Squad. But what were some of the games that influenced the actual gameplay? As we can see here, it is definitely a tactics turn-based strategy game. You've got a group of enemies, you've got your team, and you have to make sure that your team is able to take the enemies out and, of course, not die within certain parameters to get extra audience attention mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't overall lose. Yeah, like uh, the gameplay is at its core is very classic, right? We're we're influenced by the classics, like Final Fantasy Tactics. You're gonna see a little bit of this guy in there, but uh, there are two two unique things about Chroma Squad's combat, which is the teamwork, which I see you do there a lot, which is the 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 ranges can work together to either boost, uh, throw your friends with acrobatics to other other positions, or it can like you're doing there, like attack a monster together. If you like bunch up the an attack, you can do triple attack, you can do four attack. So that's a unique uh, mechanic of Chroma Squad. And the other thing is the audience system, because uh, you're not only fighting monsters, right? You're actually recording an episode of a TV show. So uh, what happens there is that uh, you need to get not only beating the monsters not enough. You need to do you need to have enough audience for your show to be successful. Part of that is making the moves as flashy as possible. Uh, you're utilizing your roles the best way you can, like the lead always uh, in teamwork and acrobatics and the assault always hitting people and stuff like that. But the main part is doing the director's instructions. So you, so if you're watching the stream there, you can see on the top left the director's instructions. So he has to do uh, defeat an enemy in the first turn. He already did that. Now he's trying to keep all the actors about 50% health. So the way these things work, they're like mini achievements. Uh, that you do to that they are guaranteed to give you more audience. And if you reach the end of the episode doing most of these of these direct instructions, you're gonna have a good episode. Uh, but the way we design these these direct instructions, they're different from other games. Like they're not special challenges. They're like side and they're really hard to do. Normally they're the most fun way to play the encounter. So the way we designed that was well what's the most fun way to approach this encounter? What what is a, a fun way to spice it up to to make it interesting and more and more challenging for the player. So uh, that's where the direct instructions are in a, in a gameplay point of view. So these two things are very much Chroma Squad, they're unique to Chroma Squad. But the rest is very, very traditional. Like if you like Final Fantasy Tactics, if you like this guy, a game like that, you're gonna like, like uh, Chroma Squad is a streamlined version of that. Something else that's kind of unique to Chroma Squad is the ability that your team has to actually transform into their for lack of a better term, they're, they're, they're Power Rangers version. Right. So uh, this is called the Henshin, right? This is when uh, they transform into their battle forms. So uh, you need audience, usually you need audience for that as well. That, that depends on the, the story of the episode. But uh, you can see you had the option there to already be transformed in this part of the episode, but you chose to like keep it. So your, your characters are still on their street clothes. Uh, but in a Chroma Squad episode, if you have enough audience, you can transform. And the, the shout and the name of that transformation is up to you. I didn't see, uh, how, how did you name your transformation? Didn't see that. Um, I'm gonna, want to, I think I should be able to switch to it here. So we might be able to see it here in the chat. Basically, I themed pretty much everything based off of our GOG stream team. So all the characters are named after the different streamers. Mm -hmm. And the company is GOG Company, and all that kind of lovely stuff, so... I love that you can customize it that much. That there's the stock stuff there for Chroma Squad, but you can really kind of... You can really just create your own team. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, the, the, main, the main thing that we wanted to allow players to do was to... Not, we didn't only want to tell a story. We wanted players to tell the story with us, so... Uh, and, and fans of Sentai and Toku culture in general, they're so creative. Like our backers had so many ideas about how they were going to do their own series and their uniforms and their special powers and their shouts. So we absolutely had to allow you to express yourself like this in the game. And there's so many cool immersion moments that, that came out of that. Like for instance, one guy here in the studio was playing and he, he called his rangers like the Rice Rangers. And his transformation shouts was eat rice so uh at a point of the dialogue someone was saying i tried to transform 
and it worked. And uh, what the character actually said was, well, I tried to eat rice, and it worked. <laughs> and then the second character right after that said, wow, that's too much to digest. <laughs> and that was totally like, it was a total accident because of the way that the, the guy customized his team, right? And this, there's so much value in that. Like, we're definitely going to keep doing this in future games for Behold Studios because that, that's, that's a load of fun. Well, when it comes to transforming, there's actually a, a lot of strategy deciding when to transform because while your characters exactly. are in their street clothes, they can't use their abilities. But when you transform, they get all their health back. Plus, it will also rearrange the team here. Exactly. So that's that maybe is the secret reason about why the rangers fight in the street clothes <laughs> instead of just transforming. There you go. Jeremy Free is the way to be. <laughs> right. Yeah, now we got all, nice. all of our lovely abilities back. So, nice. yeah, I, have, I definitely have to say, even though this game does take inspiration from a lot of things, it's got a lot of originality to it, and that's something that I really, really like Thank about Chroma Squad. Now, I've been kind of following this game, not super closely, but kind of been following it since you had your Kickstarter. And how was your experience with Kickstarter? Did, did it go... I know you got it funded, but did you have any any trouble or any worries when it came to dealing with Kickstarter? Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't here with Behold uh, for the Kickstarter, but I was around. I was nearby. It's a, it's a small industry here in Brazil. Uh, before I can gather, it was, as all Kickstarters are, very, very, like a lot of work, right? They basically had to live for this thing for the whole time it was live. But uh, what I can tell you about is how cool it was to not to be funded because uh, we ran out of that money like very quickly, but uh, we had to pay most of the development from our pockets because it got like a year late or something. But uh, we we had so much support and love from our backers. Like I couldn't imagine making this game. And frankly, I can't imagine making another game like right now without the Kickstarter backers. Because it's so cool to have, not only to have people who can give you feedback on what you're doing and can have you be a little more sure that you're going on the right path, but also that they can sh cheer you on when you're feeling down. Like uh, whenever we had to crunch really hard and like make the game work, like the last month fixing bugs and trying to find them, like the backers were always there like with a, sometimes a small phrase on Twitter, sometimes a direct message on the forums, but they're always cheering us on, always motivating us to like do our best and remember that we're making games not only for us, but for mainly for other people, right? So uh, that's certainly the best takeaway from Kickstarter for, for Behold and uh, something that we plan to keep on, keep on doing. So how many people work there at Behold Studios? Uh, that's a complicated question, actually, because uh, right now we have two teams. But uh, Behold Studios, when they started Chrome Squad, they were originally like six guys, right? Uh, but in the middle of the of the way, we we swallowed another great, great, great company from Brazil called Autos, and they're here with us. So uh, right now, Behold has about. But on the confidence to be honest, Let me just ask someone here. Uh, some quantos? Treze? About about fourteen. We're fourteen, I guess. <laughs> There's so many people, it's hard to count. For for indie dev, there is that 15 people is a crowd. But uh, yeah, Behold is 15. Does having that many people ever end up being a hindrance on the project, do you think? Or do you guys really need feel like you need every single one of those people on the team? Well, we need every one of those people because we love each other. Each other. <laughs> so uh, we, we really want them to be here. But uh, the yeah, 15 people on a single project... I don't think that's that's a good thing for indie games, so we don't do that. Uh, most of our we're we're working on multiple projects at Behold, but uh, we can't we can't announce yet what that is. <laughs> so not only did you guys go through Kickstarter, you also had a bit of an early access thing as well, I believe, where people got the or mm -hmm. it was either it was either early access or it was your backers were able to, to check the game out early. I don't remember which. But, yeah, it was the backers, but we had a slacker backer option on our website. Right. So, 
how how did that go? Did that you guys really feel that that was the best option to go with Chroma Squad? I think it was. I really think it was because, uh, like I told you, the, the having people along the way is certainly the the smarter way to develop video games. Like uh, we're making, uh, like I said, we have two teams here, and uh, the other team is doing something that we can't talk about right now. And while that that has its its cool parts, I would much rather maybe in the future we we, we will be in that point that everything we do we have our backers and and super fans all along the way with us because that's super cool, right? Like with Chroma Squad, the game definitely benefit from that, from having people able to play early and tell us early what they like and what they don't like about it. So Chroma Squad is certainly a much 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 better game than we than we would be able to do on our own. Do you guys, does Behold Studios have much of a backlog when it comes to its games, or was Chroma Squad the first thing that you guys made together? No, we did Knights of Pen and Paper. Uh, oh, actually, Behold has been around. A Behold game. Yeah, that's a Behold Studios game. Uh, actually, Behold has been around for quite a while. Uh, I think it's one of the oldest active uh, video, games co video game companies here in Brazil. Uh, They've been around for quite a while, like they ship a lot of games on mobile and stuff like that. None of them was really, really successful. The company even like closed down for a while. The guys were working on a public library for, for months while they're developing Nice of Fan and Paper. But then Nice of Fan and Paper was really, really, really successful. So Behold Studio like rose like a phoenix, right? And uh and then came Chrome Squad. So that's good to hear that. Oh man, I didn't realize oh, that Charm that would cause it. it to attack my own team. <laughs> yes, that's okay. how Charm works. Watch out. It you have like that... two turns left oh, that's to right. finish that up those fights. Okay, it, it threw some regeneration crap at me, so that's going to be a bit of a problem. <laughs> I think if I stun it, you can't stun. Yeah, like yeah, bosses can be. Yeah, bosses can be stunned, but they can be dazed, which is what you did there. Uh, when you daze a boss. Uh, the boss cannot dodge, the boss cannot counter, and you have an extra chance to dodge his or her attacks. So, uh, what I don't... I, there you go. I'm trying so, to get uh, just position so that the next turn I can pull off the amazing finishing move, but I gotta be careful. Yeah, but, so that yeah be careful. Yeah, be careful to not do it too early, because just, just like in Power Rangers, uh, you have to fin if you finish the, the boss with a f special finishing move, you get a lot more audience, right? It's the right way to, to film the episode. But uh, you can have, we give you all the freedom. You can do the episodes all the way you want. So if you want to just use the finishing move the first turn, you can. Uh, the difference is that, there you go, there's a the finish it feedback. So yeah, I gotta wait that announced. Next turn, though. Yeah, next turn you can like use all your guys. Watch out for not, not corner her so you won't have space to finish her. So uh, if you do the finishing move early, you can absolutely win the fight, but you're gonna get very little audience, which means your studio won't be that successful. Your management side, you want you you're gonna have less fans. Oh, you got charmed. You're gonna yeah. wait for that too. For that, I'm uh, not gonna be able to get both everyone. these director's instructions, but I think I'm gonna, I'll be able to take it out with the finishing move. Yeah. So something I've been wondering is: is there a way to replay previous episodes? What I've seen so far. There doesn't seem to be that option, so if you don't do everything correctly the first time you play through it, and you want to get all those director's instructions, it seems like the only way would be maybe to pause and restart that mission all over again. Yes, yes. Like, uh, you, you can replay the episodes. Once the episodes are recorded, they're, they're going to be broadcasted, and there's no turning back. So, uh... But the director instructions, they're only important as far as audience goes, because I... I see that if you finish the monster right now, you're probably going to get the maximum audience for that episode. Let's see that happen. There sure, goes the finishing move. Me. Insomnia Sale. <laughs> the GOG Insomnia Sale. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's the greatest finishing move ever. There you go. So you but probably got maximum audience, even though you missed one, because you did all the other ones, and you fought well, and used teamwork, and used acrobatics. So like I said, the game, especially on the middle and easiest difficulty, the game is forgiving. Like uh, we didn't want to 
We want to make a frictionless experience. Like if you, you don't have to get everything absolutely right to to have a proper experience on Chroma Spot. Oh, there we have the mecha fights. Here we got the mecha fights. Now, there something I wanted to ask you specifically about the mecha fights is the mecha fights are almost a completely different kind of game from the rest of the game. <laughs> yes. they, they, it's sort of like a fighting game. Not quite, but it's sort of like a fighting game. <laughs> Why did you guys decide to break them up and make them so different instead of keeping the mecha fights as still you, the turn-based strategy? Yeah, that's an interesting question because uh, that was one of my major responsibilities in the project, the mecha fight. And um, really, I really think we did a cool thing with that is that uh, our, our tactical gameplay it's designed for groups and it's designed for teamwork and stuff like that. So when you get to a one versus one fight, like which is usually how it goes when you have the, the Kaijus and the Mechas, uh, the gameplay didn't really fit. So we knew we had to do something different. Uh, the real challenge here is that, okay, the Mecha fight is like, is like the cherry on the top. It's not, um, it's not the main feature of the game, it's not the, the, the core. <laughs> But it has to be awesome, it has to be cool. But at the same time, it can't be too complicated because like the players won't have, don't want to, you have you have a debuff that is not, that is not showing. The She uses a debuff that increases the cooldown on your oh. skill, so that's probably what happened. But, I haven't uh, used some, the skill yet, so it's a little bit interesting. Yeah, she, she this, creates. This is there definitely you go, one of the, the most difficult parts. Oh, they added a cooldown. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say this uh, is one of the most uh, difficult ability. parts of the game just because it's all based around percentages much more than everything else. Right. Uh, the way the way that the mecha fight works is like push your luck. Like it, it all revolves around the combo. Uh, you can – there are lots of different skills and setups that, can, that, that you can use in your mecha. You just have this one skill there, but you can have up to four – active skills in the defense and the attack, so for a total of six skills. And uh, you can outfit your mech with different stuff and create your strategy, but it all boils down to getting that combo meter up and using it. So when you have your first hit, you see you can have 95% chance of hitting. And as you keep attacking, your combo meter rises, which increases your damage and increases the, the effect of your skills, but your chance of missing all increases as well. And whenever you miss, it's the monster's turn. So the strategy of the mecha fight is to balance risk. So I have, okay, I should, I can try to punch for one more combo to get my healing because your healing is going to be affected by the combo meter. But uh, maybe I should stop right now because I have enough. Or maybe because the boss is charging a special attack, I should just be more defensive, like do a two combo and stop because I get a huge defense bonus if I stop and defend myself. So uh, in season one and season two, you're playing the end of season two right now. Mm. Uh, the the kaiju's are very forgiving. Uh, as the game progresses, they're gonna throw uh, more special moves at you. They're gonna get a little bit stronger. And they're gonna have to to pace your fights a little better and pace the way that you. There you go. To defend yourself. I and when when it's time to attack. I hadn't noticed that I got healed. At certain times because one thing I did notice is that enemies will usually have multiple health bars so you'll have to right. fight them quite a lot and there isn't a heal option so this this sword thing over here I thought that was how much my attack was but it seems to be that that might be focused around how much I'll get healed at the end of that turn uh, no actually you are equipping these legs you have these legs equipped and these legs have a passive ability that whenever you knock a monster's health bar, one of these health bars, you get healed. Oh. But there are, there are several other mecha parts that you can craft that have different passive skills and active skills. There are several ways to heal your mecha during the battles. Yeah, uh, quite a lot but of that depends on your crap. gear. Yeah, we can, like, you just wrap up this fight. We can absolutely show the, the mecha crafting screen at the, the beginning of Season 3. Because you can craft mecha parts, you can craft just general equipment. It's not super easy to do, considering that you can't replay episodes, so you can't really grind for parts to craft things. But I definitely like that 
that's thrown in there because it, it beats having to buy everything of trying to buy five of everything at the shop is that can get rather right. expensive exactly uh if you if you're looking for a specific thing to drop on the craft for, for crafting and uh, you didn't get lucky you can absolutely buy some material packs which give you those materials anyway so uh, the idea for the random drops on the episode is to maybe give you an opportunity to craft something that wasn't exactly on a radar uh, but if you're looking to craft something specific, you can buy the, the material packs on the shop. So but, uh, yeah, you can craft all sorts of stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Does can can you craft things you can't buy? Are there certain things you can only craft that you can't actually find in the shop? Yes. Uh, so all the items you craft, they are different from the items you find in the shop because uh, to one of few things either they have random properties which depend on the crafting rate that you have. So uh, you can increase your crafting rate by buying crafting tables and stuff like that for your studio. And that can you can you and that way you can craft higher quality items. So uh, those items depend on that. And, uh, and there are also unique items that you can only craft. You can't find, they have unique effects. So for instance, we have a glove called Catapult, which increases the distance you can throw your allies. Or we have boots that make you move faster. So these these unique items you can craft. Some of them you find in the game, true story, but some, some of them are only available through through crafting. So that was a really good episode you did there. So we got a little bit of money to wrap up your season. We're gonna see the beginning of season three now. Is there a way to get I know that there each each mission seems to have a maximum amount of audience, but is there a way to get more than that maximum audience attention? Or is, is yes. that literally just the cutoff? Yes, uh, you can get more than the maximum amount of audience if you, depending on the marketing decisions, because uh, we, you have marketing agencies and what they do is that they affect, there you go, we have several marketing agencies that you can choose, that you can hire, depending on your play style. So for instance, the green team, like their back one, uh, the, the green team, it's focused on item drop rate. So uh, the abilities, uh, the, the, you choose green team for like crafting. Uh, you choose, for instance, the indie guys, the indie marketing gig, if you want to a balanced but cheap uh, approach to marketing. And there you go. So there are very Toys R fans, two, two to the right. You have like Toys R fans. They're focused on mecha and selling toys. So uh, the marketing is like a statement of your strategy and your play style. So uh, if you choose, a, there are marketing agencies that can increase your global audience scan. Game, so you can get more than the maximum amount in each episode if that's what you want. And these actually change as you go through all the different seasons and through the different episodes. Yes. Because originally I only had the option of about these three. Yes. And then eventually. And now you have a bunch of new ones. ones. Yes. And you eventually they email you, so we have an email system in the game with all kinds of random events that pop up, like uh, even story changing events or unique items that you can find and decisions that you can make, like they all come through this this email system. And uh, we don't really know, like I don't have any idea of what kind of emails have you got on your campaign so far. So you can absolutely play the whole game like several times and miss uh, some of the, the unique encounters in the game because you didn't get the email or you didn't answer uh, the email in a certain way. There isn't a right or wrong way to answer the emails in Chroma Squad. They just take you to different, to different results, I guess. Well, one of the things that just happened at the end of that episode is I got an audience booster, which mm -hmm. was actually yes, something did. that I got in an email earlier. Exactly. I don't. It's one of the. Yeah. I don't necessarily know which one it is. But he he is emailing again right now. There you go, Sub Gaga here. So that email there. Send a reply. And there so we they're go. they're we definitely stuff. So we got fans increased in I, I definitely really like that there's all these different things thrown in the game so that every time you play the game, even though some of it will be similar, a lot of it will be different. Yes. Like uh, one of the super cool things that happened during the, the beta testing was that uh, we had backers like email us and ask, Hey, we reached the rider episodes stretch goal. I didn't find any riders, and then we said, oh, well, uh, this branch of the story that you are probably didn't have the rider, and the guy then, did I branch the story? When did that happen? <laughs> so the, the cool, we, we really like this kind of thing that two people can play the game, 
and they could talk to each other about it and what they did and what happened. And suddenly they realized that they had completely different, like they had events that the other person is not even remotely aware of. And that, that for me is a really cool experience because it creates these moments outside the game that you, that you can talk to people. And of course, it, it increases the playability. So if you finish Chroma Squad on one difficulty, you see one of the three endings and you see one path of the story. So if you want to play the game again, maybe boost up the difficulty, something like that. It's going to be a cool experience still because there's a lot of things that you missed. Do you have any idea how many random events are in the game? Are there like a couple uh, of I can open the project right now and tell you. <laughs> I estimate there are uh, about 50-ish, 70-ish, but probably more. That's a lot. So that's really cool to so, hear yeah. that the game has so much replayability, which is not necessarily something that you would expect from a story-driven tactical RPG. Right. So yeah, we we did a lot of stuff for this game. Like uh, sometimes we we just released an update for a Kickstarter uh, explaining all the things that changed in the game during this these two years that we have been developing it uh, since the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, and among the things that uh, we were talking about to our backers was that the game was delayed like a year. We we when we pitched the Kickstarter, we estimated that we that we would deliver in 2014. Uh, we ended up delivering it one year later. Uh, I think the main reason for that is that we fell so much in love with the possibilities of and, and things that we could do in the game that uh, we decided, fuck it, let's just do it, right? Let's just do this thing and uh, make it bigger, make it better. Like uh, we started to having these ideas like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if the emails like did this? And then we did it. Uh, in the end, we, we ended up with a big game, but I, I think you will find that all the parts are very cohesive, like nothing seems, everything interacts with everything else, and uh, it feels like a cohesive package, even though there's so much stuff in it. Now you've talked about how you've interacted with your Kickstarter backers before, and I'm going to guess that that was apparently a Kickstarter tier where you could actually be put in the game, because there are a couple of characters that you can pick, to, or a couple of actors that you can pick, that it specifically yes. said are Kickstarter backers. And there are mm -hmm. also a couple missions where some random people will actually show, like there was one guy who was like a, a silver mm -hmm. uh, dude <laughs> yes. who was from space and was awesome. And there was another dude who was who was like some kung fu guy in a street yes. and it was awesome. <laughs> so uh, the, there's a very cool thing about this, really cool, is that uh, we... We had tier Kickstarter tiers where you can participate in a game. So, like you said, there are actors, there are characters. These characters that you mentioned, like almost all of the companions that you can gather in the episodes, they are Kickstarter backers who who back the game on that tier, right? Uh, but from the start, we tried to integrate these 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 backers of the game in a way that that made sense. So uh, the cool thing is that all those characters that appear seemingly at random. And somehow they fight the evil guys with you, and it feels so random. But I assure you, I cannot spoil you, but I assure you that there is a very cool uh, explanation in the game lore about why that happens. Because I was wondering if they either, after they showed up, I would have the chance to maybe hire them, or if they would eventually show up again in another mission. They eventually show up again, depending on the on the story path that you take, right? Uh, but no, you cannot recruit them for for your team. That's a shame. But something that I really do like about Chroma Squad is how it's able to blend together the ideas of recording a show and. And like the show being real and the show not being real at the exact same time because the minions you never see the minions out of costume you and there's no way yes. to know whether or not you're fighting the same guys they don't go into that and when you quote unquote kill the minions are you actually killing the minions it never <laughs> it never actually says it just leaves it up to you so yes we leave it up to you actually you just started season 3 so uh, they're definitely gonna be 
some very interesting surprises for you about that. So yeah, <laughs> but definitely this this method thing about playing with what is real and what is not is definitely at the core of the story of Chrome as well. All right, let's see if I can try to get a three attack on this guy. All of these characters are definitely all these minions are definitely a lot more difficult than they used to be. Because the last <laughs> ep the last season, I was fighting late, literally named lame versions of pretty much lame, everything. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if the the people on Twitch had time to read the little balloons there, but what actually happened is that uh, on the previous season you were having money problems, but uh, you you had the that Gaga guy come into your studio and install the audience booster, and now you're making season three. And suddenly you're big time. Now your studio is like super popular. You have money pouring in from every from every door, and uh, you can make the show better and bigger. So the minions are new. They they are they're more powerful. You have more skills and, and stuff like that. But also things are going to change, right? And the way that you record your episodes, things are going to change. And the way that uh, your studio works because of this, you're going to see that in the story for this season. So if I wouldn't have had the guy come in and add the booster, would something different be happening in season three? Uh, unfortunately, it was. Well, you can like uh, there is no way to avoid. No matter what which reality you live, <laughs> you always have the audience booster installed in your in your studio some some way, right? So season three always has the audience booster, but there are other choices that you can make. That I won't spoil, but uh, there are other other choices. Oh. And, other, and they're not only they're not always related to major major stuff. Like, all, of course, you have we have major story branches that really change the way the entire season is laid out. But uh, we also have minor things that are super cool. Like, for instance, depending on what you do in season three and the way you respond to certain events, uh, you may or may not see on season four a small thing happen. Like, uh, we, we really like these small touches because even if they're not everywhere, even if not all email and not every decision is going to be super important, we feel like given this, this feeling that everything potentially can, like, affect the story and seeing the repercussions of decisions, that's what player likes about RPGs. That's why we all play RPGs, because we want them to capture imaginations. So we're getting, it's about 1.47 right now, so I'm going to open up the interview a little bit to chat. So if anybody in chat has any questions that you would like to ask Mark, feel free to put those in chat, and either he and or I will see them, and if I see them, I'll relate them to him, and if he sees them, he'll hopefully just flat out answer them. So if you have anything you would like to ask him, throw that out there for right now, or forever hold your peace as I kill this guy. <laughs> I definitely so, like how yeah. each character seems is their own class. None of them feel redundant. Yeah, like uh, each of the five roles, they have very, very unique uh, feel in the gameplay, right? The lead is like a support or tank, depending on how you spec him. Like the, the assist the, the assist heals, but uh, you're going to find there, there are ways to, de to deal damage with the, with the assist in later seasons, which are really cool. Like, I really like to use my assist as a damage dealer sometimes. But, uh, yeah, but we try to make every role very, very unique and, and have their gameplay, like, complete each other really well. Also, the the name for that one move, the Heal Dukin, is genius. <laughs> it's Thank <not> you. Genius. <laughs> Thank you. Like, uh, there's a lot of Sentai references in this skill name. So, for instance, this skill just used the Eagle Lasso. That's uh, our homage to uh, a very classic Sentai series. Really, really classic. Like, as classic as it gets. Uh, and yeah, like, uh, you guys should be... We have a small delay on the Twitch, right? So people can, like, probably right now they're hearing about making those questions. But uh, any other questions that you guys have, we're going to have uh, Ask Me Anything with the other devs on Twitch, like, in a few minutes, if you want to join that as well. So, uh, Mellow Cow is asking us something. Yes, he's asking. This game, game has has an in-depth story. 
And uh, it really can Yeah, we really focus a lot on story. Like, uh, you, we not only have an in-depth story, but we also have uh, branching stories. So you get to make decisions in the game. They affect the way that your story plays out. And uh, you can have three different endings depending on how your story played out. Uh, it's going to affect which companions join or not your team. Uh, it may affect the, the layout of entire seasons of the game. Like the game's laid out in, in six seasons. It's not an episodic game, don't worry about that. It's just because it's a TV show, right? So it's divided in seasons. <laughs> like the chapters in the game. So uh, you can change the, the layout of entire chapters in the game. And, uh, and we also affect the secret endings that you can find that no one found as of now. So the game has been out since yesterday and people have found out that those even exist. So there's a challenge for you, Internet. How many seasons are there overall? Right now I'm on season three. Yeah, there are six seasons in the game. But do you guys have any uh, plans season... to add more onto the game? later on if there's that much interest in it yeah if there's enough interest I'm definitely gonna keep supporting the game like uh, there's so much opportunity to make subs in the in, this, in the Chrome Squad universe uh, we probably won't add seasons because we think the story and the uh, and the gameplay of Chrome Squad it wraps up really well uh, what we're probably gonna end up doing if we're gonna do more content is find out is figure out a way to do some sort of new game plus and then add standalone campaigns and episodes to it but uh, that's still that's still depending on how well the game is received like I said the game was out yesterday uh, so still waiting on reveals and stuff like that and sales and see how well people like our game so let's find that out together does it so far do you have does it seem to be doing well it, it really does it really does like uh, so far we have been receiving lots and lots of love really more than we expected uh, like smaller reveals came out like none of the big shots uh, but uh, the smaller reveals so far have been full of love very positive they're pointing issues that are all patchable so so far we haven't received criticism that is not something that we can fix so this makes me very happy <laughs> because I definitely plan on fixing them that was definitely good. You never want to hear back a problem that's like, well, we don't like this core aspect of the game that it's on time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But so far, there have been minor, minor things that we can definitely change in and improve. So it's been, it's been a good ride. Oh man, this plant guy is hard. <laughs> you wouldn't think it would be yeah, the man, plant guy that would be difficult. <laughs> yeah, so uh, season one and two, they are kind of introduced. An introduction to the game, they're shorter. There are two short seasons, season one and two. And uh, the gameplay is simple, like the monsters have less skills, and uh, you have less skills and less things to worry about in all aspects of the game. Like from season three onwards, the game gets much more complex and frankly, much more interesting. I'm definitely feeling it here. I was very, very mm. confident in the all the way through season two. A little bit not super confident when it came to some of the mech battles, but for the most part with the tactics, I, it was all right. Didn't really have to worry about anybody mm. dying. But right now, there's a lot of damage going on in my direction. Yeah, one thing that you have to really watch out, especially if you're playing on the latest difficulties, is with uh, characters. If you can mouse over the boss here just for a second before you attack him, just mouse over the boss. Oh, there you go. Because uh, you attack the boss with four people, uh, bosses don't like that. If you crowd the bosses, they're going to be pissed off. Like uh, they're going to have the enraged status, which increases their damage. So uh, there you go, seven seven damage. If you can mouse over the the boss for a minute, you can see. There it is. Oh, I didn't notice he's got all those extra stats. Because what I was, yeah, my yeah. thought was, if I surround him, then you know he can't get away. So like people will be near him for the next turn, and I can do another big. Uh, another yeah, I mean, just team attack. You can see that if you put the mouse in the base, the tile where the monster is, you can see a little, like a little sheet, and you can, uh, you can see all the little icons there. So uh, you can mouse over the icons if you want to. You can see what they do. Like uh, enrage. There you see. So uh, enrage. 
is there, the first one, is there because you attack the monster with four people. So the monsters don't like to be when you do that. So usually it's a good idea to only do that if you're planning on finishing the buff maybe on the next turn, which is probably what's going to happen now, right? Um, I don't, he doesn't have the finish star on him yet, so I can't actually do a finishing move. Uh, I think he did. Uh, the last time you hit him, I might be wrong though. Not from what I saw. Oh no, he. I think he healed. No, no, he was healed. Yeah, yeah he that's healed right. The minion, the little frog there. You gotta get. You gotta get rid of the frog. I'm trying to, but everyone's so far <laughs> away. That's something that I am noticing a lot in this game. A lot of it is trying to make up distance. Since you only get, un yeah. unlike other turn-based tactics games, well, you'll get a bunch of action points. You only get two, mm. so you can basically either move twice, or move an attack, or just attack. Yeah, so, so like uh, we we were heavily influenced uh, by XCON on that decision. Like we thought it was a very simple to understand uh, system that would that just makes a lot of sense. It makes things more streamlined and faster because you have these possibilities. Uh, but also we wanted to make well, Chroma Squad's combat is very much about uh, movement. So you're gonna see, especially from season three, that uh, we do our best in the in the combat design to try to make the monsters and the, the and the maps in a way that you're always like spreading out and then closing in and then joining up again. And uh, this is what we think it's fun about the way that fights happen in Power Rangers and Sentai. That you're always like moving around, and then they're fighting the monsters by themselves, and they, they join up again, and they they do something together, spread out again. So there's always the, these movement dynamics going on, and we try to capture that with uh, Chroma Squad's combat. And I think we were pretty successful. Like I really like when you have like the guys spread out, and you have to join them up, have to heal them. It's it's really fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I just noticed that now that I'm in Season 3, since the way that abilities go with your characters is depending upon what season you're in, depends upon what abilities you actually have. And for this particular season, the lead has actually unlocked the ability to completely regroup everybody. Yes. So that is so, definitely uh, going to be useful. Yeah, Join Up is one of the best skills in the game. Like, uh, every season you get new skills for your actors, and uh, you have to choose. Like, uh, you have, like, a tree... And you can, at any point, it can change. It's not a permanent decision. Like, uh, before you go into an episode, you can change your skills. Uh, but you always have to decide which ones you're going to use and which ones you're going to leave out. And as the seasons progress, you have you get a wider variety of skills and gets customization gets a lot more interesting. We start to see a lot of build variation. And the combination with the items, like, there, there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah, because my assist character here has got the ability to regen now. You can only have a certain amount of abilities available at one time, but the different tiers of them open up as seasons go. So we're getting really close to the end of the interview now, so if anybody has any last-minute questions, ask them now. Because once the interview ends, uh, you can head over... To... Actually, once the interview ends, you can still ask questions because they're going to be hosting that AMA. So if you want to, go ahead and put a link to that in the chat. And I think you said that they've already started over there and you'll be joining them uh, after you're done here. So if you want to put a link to that in the chat, people can head over and get ready for that. Do you guys have uh, Facebook, Twitter, website, anything like that that people can use to yes. keep track of you so, and your game? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Mark Venturelli. Behold Studios is on Twitter at Behold Studios. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Behold Studios. And uh, facebook.com slash Chroma Squad. Uh, we're going to be on Reddit AMA right now. I'm looking for the link. Uh, someone give me a link. Uh, but if you just follow us on Twitter or Facebook right now, we're going to find out where that is. So the rest of the guys, not me, they're going to be there answering questions. Here's the link. I just found it. I'm going to post the link on the chat. I am Rogue Snail here in the chat. There goes the link. It's right there. Uh... So if you have any more questions about anything, I'm going to be there answering you. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much. Yeah, and any of those of you in chat who are still interested in seeing more of this game, I'm going to be playing this for another hour. So if you're interested in that, feel free to stay here on GOG.com. Thank you very much, Mark, for talking to me today. I really do appreciate it. Chroma Squad is a great game. I really, really have enjoyed my time with it so far. Something I haven't talked about yet is the music. And the music in this game just 
fits it perfectly. It's 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 it's, it's all around a solid a solid game. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Like, uh, it's really good to hear this kind of thing. I really agree about the music. Like, I'm really proud of our of our music guys, Washington Rake and Rafael Miller. They really did an amazing job on that. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, in for your invite. This was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Is there anything that you want to specifically say or cover before I let you go? No, I think we're fine. Just uh, join us on, on Reddit if you want to keep talking about Comscore. All right, definitely hang out, head over there if you're interested in that. Thank you again, Mark, for talking to me, and I uh, hope to talk to you guys a little bit later. Woohoo! Yes. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Mark from Behold Studios talking about his game Chroma Squad. And I have to say, I'm not just necessarily saying that to be nice, just to be nice. <laughs>